it's very hard to come, come up with what I wanted to say and what my takeaways were from this trip. And I titled this, I'm an evolving response to an ever-changing situation. I'm an evolving response to an ever-changing situation. So it's finally time to share, and it's taken me weeks upon weeks to try and absorb and figure out what I really have to say about this trip. I would be lying that, lying if I didn't admit that I feel pressure to be able to give some real takeaways from this trip. <sighs> I felt like I need to be able to prove that going to Israel has given me a point of view that's different post October 7th as someone who's been able to travel there than perhaps some of you who have not been able to be there. How many people have been in Israel since October 7th? So I felt this pressure, but then I remembered that just like a painting hanging in a museum or a song that an artist releases on the radio, I have surrendered to allowing you all to listen and interpret my experiences in your own hearts. This trip was life-changing. In the same way that the 1994 earthquake was or 9-11 or how the pandemic changed my existential view of the universe. So here we are, here we go. I will, um, it will, like, we're going to explore my um, trip through these visual creations that I spent far too much time on because that's just what happened. <laughs> so here we go. There we go. <laughs> so, so many thoughts were going through my head. I, I like did the fancy cutout, but we were at the airport. <laughs> will I be safe? Am I crazy? Will I be homesick? I reminded myself that I have to do this. How has my past behavior regarding my stance on Israel affected my opinions today? Have I been too casual about my opinions? Has my choice to remain as apolitical on the Bema as I can affected the future generation's love for Israel? How will my thoughts of the world we live in today be altered by this trip? Will I just be too tired to take it all in? Will my jet lag make it too hard to focus? So yes, behind this cute, fun picture was a lot of anxiety and a lot of questions. But alas, we landed. And we spent 48 hours adjusting to the time. I was very lucky. That's my view from our first hotel in Tel Aviv. The most controversial sea is also the most beautiful. My love for the water comes from these waters, reminding me of the freedom that I felt in Israel as a 12-year-old when my parents put me and my triplet brother and sister on a plane and said, go visit some unknown cousins in Israel. You'll have a great time. <laughs> the summer before our B'nai Mitzvah. Yeah, I know, Bowie. <laughs> I wrote here. <laughs> so corny. Core memories activated. It was true. <laughs> and as I swam in the Mediterranean and took in the sunsets, I indeed felt like the 12-year-old Lizzie, completely intimidated by a new country, and yet discovering the freedom of this holy land. And that part had not changed. But this trip was not a vacation. 10-7 is inescapable. Not that anyone would want to forget it, but the images of the hostages and the dead greet you at Ben Gurion Airport. They haunt you as you walk alongside the boardwalk. Out of despair, huge installations have been created in the heart of Hostage Square, a large table representing the Shabbat table where the missing should be. This table was clean and vibrant in October. Now it looks quite literally covered in dust. The first week I attended the Havdalah and the rally at Hostage Square, the table looks like it did in that upper photo. And just one week later, we noticed that someone had added a personal teddy bear, you can see just below, to every single seat of the table. That is the kind of care people were showing. 
So my first job on this journey was to participate and to learn and to sing and raise money for Ramat HaNegev, for this region of Israel. It's the sister city of Las Vegas, Nevada, and many of you know my best friend is the cantor there. So I was invited, along with cantor um, Kyle Kotler, <laughs> um, to present a concert to raise money for the people of the region. Um, they've spent countless hours and dollars to take in evacuees from the north and the south of Israel. This region actually represents 20% of Israel, and we work directly with the mayor, who's doing great work. And I want to say in advance, not in advance, is this ringing? Thank you to so many congregants who contributed towards the donations for this concert. So we had the honor, Cantor Hutchings and Cantor Kotler and I, to be escorted around the region for a day. We were given a historical tear. You know, Amanda, if you can turn down the mic a little, it's ringing, sorry. Cantor Hutchings, Cantor Kotler, and I were escorted around the region for a day. We were given a historical tour of the original research outpost from 1943, where the Israelis quite literally discovered how to grow tulips in the desert. We met Lior, she's um, in the picture with me on the bottom there, from Kibbutz Revivim, a young mother who is the caretaker of the temporary burial site of Kibbutz Berry. They helped 27 bodies or remnants, sometimes just a toy, be buried at Kibbutz Revivim. She was a true example of how the stories we have heard about how all Israelis were called to service on October 7th and the subsequent days, weeks, and months to follow. For hours, days, and weeks, soldiers and families showed up to Kibbutz Revivim because it was considered safe. It's in the center, if you can imagine Israel, and go down to the desert, it's right in the middle, more than an hour drive from Gaza. Israel's small, so that was considered far. On the same day, we visited with a brave woman named Buria from Kibbutz Kerem Shalom. How many people here have heard of Kerem Shalom? Probably because of the crossing these days. It's only 60 families. She and 46 families from Karim Shalom were residing in this community in Ramat HaNegev called Ashlim. She told us how through a series of miracles, only two people from 60 families of her kibbutz were murdered on October 7th. She had no idea of the extent of the war until she put her three kids in her car, her three her three, actually, she put her three dogs in her car after being in a shelter for 36 hours in her shelter with her kids and her dogs. And, and let me tell you this again because it struck me. They're in the shelter. They lose internet. You know, you have to understand this is one of the things that I learned that people didn't know quite what was happening beyond, let's say, their kibbutz and their WhatsApp group in their kibbutz. And when it was finally safe, the IDF said, take your kids, take your dogs, and get to the bus that is going to a lot where we have a hotel for you. And she decided, oh, it's too much to put all of my stuff and, all my, and my kids and my dogs in the car, so I'm going to send my three teenagers with the community in the bus, and I'm going to take my car. And the IDF soldier said to her, if your car survived, she said, what do you mean? She went out, luckily it had, but she didn't know that so many cars had been burned. She took her three dogs, put them in her car, and at just about 6 o'clock, it was still very bright out, she left on a caravan of cars with dozens and dozens of people and went down that very road with still bodies and cars laying in the ground. And it wasn't until she went on that journey that she truly understood the extent of what had happened and that this wasn't just a couple of terrorists that had breached their solar fields, which is what she had first thought. However, while they were in the shelter, she did get a text message. Her, her son, her 16-year-old son, got a text message from his best friend who lived at a different kibbutz who said, my parents were just murdered in front of me. And they spent the rest of the time 
helping him, talking to him on WhatsApp, and he, sa- and he was hidden in, in their shelter. She said it was a miracle that uh, her neighbor had basically like a ring doorbell, which wasn't breached. You know, um, the terrorists took out the, communi- uh, the co- communication space, but they were able to see um, the Hamas soldiers, terrorists, in their solar fields and activate their emergency crew, which saved literally 58 out of, no, there were 60 families and only two um, were murdered, two people were murdered. And she said it was a miracle that she decided to put her kids in the bus because the bus left after dark and they didn't see any of the terror that the people that were driving in the cars saw. So our time, as you can see in Ramat HaNegev, was very special. We spoke to evacuees that were still, nine months later, staying in our hotel. And we gave that concert. I think I have a slide here. We gave, um, a con- we gave our concert at Kibbutz Day Boker, and it was magical. And I do hope that it's the first of many to come. It's a very um, isolated kibbutz, and they c- just couldn't believe what they were seeing. We had to explain what a cantor is, what, what does it mean for Jewish music to even be published. It was, it was a big thing. And actually, you can see um, in the blue dress on the left next to me, and, and two of those musicians are the two that wrote that, because ah, I knew that I couldn't give an entire concert in Hebrew. I needed some help, so we invited them to sing. So those first couple days of the journey were complete. And we had our opening night of our conference. So I want to just start, in case they're watching, they're not, but uh, to give credit where it's due. So we joined 60 cantors and musicians for this uh, mission. So I have to praise cantors Andrea Ray Markowitz from Om Shalom in Chicago and Leslie Nyron from Emmanuel Dallas for truly curating one of the highest quality trips I've ever experienced. Each seminar and speaker represents, represented the highest quality of character, intelligence, and wisdom that I could ever imagine. So you'll see in that bottom right square, we started the night with the cast of the Times of Israel podcast, moderated by Jessica Steinberg. She's the editor of, um, at, at, she's the Times of Israel cultural, culture, culture and lifestyle editor. Haviv Retig Gore, a lot of people follow him, a senior analyst at the Times of Israel, and Tal Schneider, a political correspondent. They just talked about so many things. I went back and I was listening to it this week. The reality of the war on the ground compared to the perception of the war by Israeli citizens, it was very different. He talked about how tactically, after a few weeks, this war would now become an example for the future of how a war should be fought. I know that can be controversial, but he believes that the way that this war is being fought was actually in a a very good way. But that doesn't matter. Israeli citizens didn't believe that. They think that it's a a political uh, war. Um, Tal explained that the media, remember this is a month ago, a lot has changed in a month, that the media does not cover the fact that Israel has 50 to 60 rockets a day coming into Israel from Lebanon, and the fact that there are 100,000 people evacuated from the northern border, and at that point, 10 villages were completely ruined. Two cities were completely destroyed. I think she said, imagine if Toronto and Buffalo were completely evacuated. She talked about how we have the Iron Dome, but we can't intercept anti-tank missiles. They're hitting people, houses, agricultural fields, and structures and barns. Many of the kibbutzim and moshavs are ruined. And what she said was, it's very bad. Families are living in hotels, and this is not good for our youth. There's a lack of belief that the government wants to negotiate it all. And despite the reality, when you ask Israelis about the war, they say, ugh, it's all about the politics. I'm not giving an opinion. I'm telling you what these people say. So that was a night that they really gave us an overview on what was happening in Israel. 
literally looking at breaking news by the moment and trying their best to give us uh, an apolitical sense of the facts of the war. So what were we there to do? Uh, I couldn't represent everything, but the first picture, building. We worked with a, an, an amazing association that was taking pallets and building furniture that different kibbutzim were asking for. So yes, even me, I think I was standing there, I made a planter. We all made planters because one of the kibbutzim that are out in the desert really wanted to have the ability to plant. Um, in the middle, that is a group of us. Um, we, we went on our last night, actually. We served a barbecue and gave tons of donations to um, an IDF base. Um, it is the one, if anyone's heard of the five women who got on the uh, tank and, and basically were able to kill a bunch of terrorists, even though nobody else kind of believed them. That was the communications base. And then the last part, so building, serving, and supporting, that's at Hostage Square, just standing among families of the hostages. So when this trip was created, it was designed to be just a magical cultural infusion of music and food and culture for canters. I hate to say it, but not like a congregational trip, a trip for us to just like really enjoy and have fun. I mean, I, I love congregational trips. Um, <laughs> music and art as a whole have always been important, of course, to express sadness, anger, and joy and everything in our world. And so you can imagine that this was just amplified after 10-7. Our first day led us to some unbelievable cultural experiences. You can see here, the Ramon School of Music. It's kind of like Israel's Berkeley College of Music, serving 700 students. Polyphony, the first Arab-Israeli orchestra that recently made its debut at Carnegie Hall. There we were elated to hear unbelievable ensembles, jazz ensembles, Balkan ensembles, s beautiful singers. We even heard about a project put on by the Ramon School in which they worked with 14 Nova Festival survivors in a songwriting workshop. It was, it was really, really beautiful. But soon our elation would turn to tears as Shaked and Sheer were introduced. Their parents met at the Ramon School 28 years ago. And they opened by telling us that their parents had been murdered on October 7th. They're about 22 and 24 years old. Their parents died while shielding their 16-year-old son, their brother, Rotem, who was hidden behind a mattress between the bed frame and the wall. You've heard this, right? This, there's another, there's, first of all, there's a lot of road thems. I, I'd be surprised if he did, but I'd like to hear if he did. I know, but there's another story like that. I only say that because he couldn't even talk when this, on our trip. We'll see. Okay. Well, let's we'll see if it's the same one. It's the same road tem that hid behind the mattress. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so as I sit and I listen to this story, I started to put some puzzle pieces together. I don't know if anyone else here has done this yet. Could it be? That Buria, the woman from Karam Shalom, could it be that the boy that she said they were texting with was Rotem? After the presentation, I asked them and they said, yes, Buria was my mom's best friend and Rotem was Buria's son's best friend. What a small world. So are you following that? The story we heard, had heard on the Monday about her son tech, getting a text from the best friend, it turned out to be they were best friends. Um, we had this a beautiful day, and at the end of the day, we released balloons for the hostages, something that's become very common. For a country that largely recognizes itself as secular, the entire nation stops on Shabbat. Beit Tefila Israeli invited our entire conference to participate in this very popular Shabbat. It was hot, and it was beautiful. And if you want to see videos, let me know. The only thing that I can say is that there was a sad reality, which was that the security was really intense around the pier. I asked if it was because of the war, and to my even further dismay, the response was, no, it's for the ultra-Orthodox who like to interrupt the progressive movement's Shabbat.
speaking of Shabbat, I did take the opportunity the second Saturday of my trip to bask in the sun of Tel Aviv. I just want to say it still exists there. And the next morning, we headed to celebrate Rosh Chodesh at, uh, with the women of the wall. And yes, those are all three professional photos that were sent to me, including that third one uh, with the man with covering his ears. I can't help but recall that before October 7th, the people of Israel were already in deep conflict within their politically diverse environments. And for the most part on my trip, I was able to see how people put their differences aside to put humanity first. So many of you have become familiar with the amazing Anat Hoffman, the director of the progressive movement, used to be the director of the progressive movement in Israel, started Women of the Wall. We had her here for High Holidays two years ago. And um, that, that's where we uh, went to celebrate Rosh Chodesh. But I'm really sorry to say that this is, I was going to say the one place, but the second place after the pier, where I did experience a divide and it was in the holiest place of the world. Standing in line for 45 minutes to try and get through security, we were told that security was really just messing with us to purposely make us late. Young yeshiva girls stared at us with disgust as we proudly waited for our chance to get in. But perhaps the scariest and most despicable was an ultra-Orthodox woman who pushed us, pushed me really hard and said, I have to get through. There's two terrorists. I have to tell the police. And then we realized that she was saying that to get to the front of security. So why? Why teach these young girls to hate? Why would their mothers spit at us and tell us to go back to the United States? Because we had the nerve to celebrate Rosh Chodesh proudly wearing our Women of the Wall Tully tote. Yes, Israel is a beacon of Western ideology in the Middle East but we still have a long way to go to help the heroes of the progressive movements of Israel succeed in giving women and other minorities the right to be observant Jews. We had um, gotten to Jerusalem after Tel Aviv, and we were visited um, by many different guests, actually, at the hotel. First, we were visited by Jackie and Yaron Vital, whose daughter was murdered on 10-7. Perhaps um, one of the most poignant people that I felt so privileged to meet, um, the second picture over, Dr. Kochav El Kayam Levy, Levy. She established the Civil Commission on October 7th Crimes by Hamas against women and children. And in her speech before the UN Committee on the Elimination of Discrimination Against Women, she represented Israel's, Isra Israel's women's rights movement. You could just see the sadness and the pain. She's seen every video. She's talked to everybody. And she was at the UN when they um, refused to recognize um, the brutal atrocities that Hamas um, did on not just women, but men too. She said that she had started her foundation as uh, a dream, and now she felt like she was living a nightmare. But I would, rec I would um, look her up. She's really interesting. We also, um, the, the top square there, were able to hear from Mohammed Darashi, a leading political analyst and expert on Jewish-Arab relations inside Israel. So uh, we also went to the Knesset that day. In the bottom there, you can see Rabbi Rick Jacobs, the president of the Union for Reform Judaism, and Gilad Kariv, who is a member of the Knesset and um, also the director of the um, Israel Movement for Progressive Judaism. So we were really, really just... Uh, he, we, we were given so much time. And by the way, I didn't write this, but... Cantors. It was a big deal that we were being recognized and so much energy was being given to talk to us. That was actually a, a really an honor. So when we first saw our itinerary for the trip, one thing was very clear, and I assumed it was intentionally planned, and that was that the second to last day would be the big day when we visited Gaza, the Gaza Envelope. So in Hebrew, the area is called the Otef, 
This word um, might sound completely unknown to you, but actually many of you are familiar with a prayer that includes its root. Each service, when we wrap ourselves in our tali tote, we say, lehit atef, batsit sit. The root to wrap, otef, lehit atef. And while this area is very, a very literal interpretation of the property surrounding Gaza, the Gaza envelope, I can't help but relate to this in our entry into a day and into a space where we would be wrapped in an envelope of solace, memories of those that we have lost and trauma for centuries to come. Many of my colleagues were just simply nervous to be in the place where so much tragedy had occurred. In my case, I really did feel like I had seen so many photos and videos that I wasn't really, really intimidated by what we were to experience. In fact, the time that I became most teary-eyed, and maybe some of you saw this video, was when three soldiers, there it is, three soldiers, they're in the bottom left there, came up to us and thanked us for being there after participating in our memorial. They weren't planned, to, they, they just happened to be there and they wanted to be a part of it. And they came up with tears in their eyes and they thanked us and they said, we can't believe you're here, we you know, we know that we can protect ourselves here, but the anti-Semitism happening in the United States and across the world is really, truly scary. And they actually encouraged us to stay strong and reminded us that they would be here uh, for us too. And those are, that is the one time of this trip that tears just flooded to my eyes. That recognition was really, really special. So, of course, I could spend an entire hour talking about just this, this day. Let me go back here. Um, uh, from standing at the Overlook, getting a very historical interpret uh, interpretation of Gaza from the last Jewish mayor of Gaza, Grisha Yukovich, to the unbelievable lunch that we had at O.C.'s house. You can see her right there. We all bought her recipe books. It was one of the best meals I've had in my life. Uh, we sat, um, oh, and actually you can see she is holding the part of a missile that by some miracle had just landed in her front yard. Um, that reminds me of saying that, you know, so many people, like one of the things she told us is when she hears the missile, she doesn't run into her shelter and close the door. She opens her front door so that people can run in who might not be home so that they're driving and in this case, so many people were just inviting terrorists into their home. <sighs> so we sat um, also for an hour on the porch of this man in Kafar Aza. <sighs> so where we were sitting on his porch, we could see the little window that was his shelter. He and his wife stayed in there for 36 hours, literally watching through the window the Hamas terrorists drinking and smoking and eating on their patio. And I asked him, why, why didn't they breach your shelter? This just doesn't make sense, everything that we've heard. And it just turned out that the way that their house was, um, he had been asked earlier in the day, can you go check on my neighbor's wife? And he found her dead. And they thought that the house was one house. That was, it was so close to the other house that he believes that the terrorists just thought that the house was empty. <sighs> so he is among only 12 people out of 1,000 that have come back to Kafar Aza. He wanted to come back. The IDF said, you cannot come back. And he said, you weren't here for me that day and you don't get to tell me that I don't get to come back home. You can imagine the um, intensity that that was told to us with. Um, you can see different pictures here from Kafar Aza. There was a section that I wasn't allowed to take pictures because there were still five hostages, uh, and, and there's a fear that, that the pictures, if they're put on social media, will be used to taunt hostages. Um, I just wanted to share this because it was so beautiful. Um, I couldn't get it in one picture, but there are three flags on his porch. The Israeli flag, the pride flag, and if you can see on the bottom, a black flag. 
And of course, we asked, how long has that been up? And he said, when he came back, he put it up and that it was like a giant Korea ribbon blowing in the wind um, to remember all of his friends who had been murdered. As we moved our way through hotels and restaurants and stores, the conversations that I had with Israeli citizens were really the most amazing to me. Oh, that's a fun one, but hold on. <laughs> they were raw and honest. So I can't give you these political uh, conversations, but I'll tell you two things that almost every person told me when they heard we were from the States. Again, these are things Every person said to us, number one, thank you for coming. We still can't believe people are choosing to come to a land in the middle of the war. We feel the unity from the Jews in the USA. Number two, this is going to be looked at as political, but I'm just telling you what they said. We love Biden. There's been such an ugly representation of how our government has helped or not helped Israel, but I can tell you from soldiers to parents to waiters, everyone said that they felt the tremendous support of the United States government, and specifically Biden, who had been on the phone with the hostage families every single week. Still to this day, I don't know if he's still on these hostage calls for, for, the, um, for the hostage families, when they have not yet received a call from Netanyahu. And they proudly told us that. <sighs> and the third truth that was constant was that although many citizens believed that the war was, at least in the beginning, 100% justified, they've now come to believe that new tactics have to be created. How? Who? The only answer we heard, whether it was from Gilad Kariv or from the past Gaza mayor, or our progressive rabbi and cantor friends, is that the only way to get the hostages back is to work with moderate Palestinian voices. I will be honest, I have yet to hear who these voices are, but that is the answer that I got over and over again. Almost done. Cantor uh, rabbi Shani Ben Or sat with me at the final night of the trip and said, Lizzie, you have to understand, it's my own Zionism that makes me want the people of Gaza and the Palestinian people to have a safe state. It's my own Zionism that believes that our government can do better. That stuck with me, and I couldn't help but think that I need to recognize my own privilege to live in the United States and to remind me that all, that all people in this world to live, deserve to live a life even half as good as ours. On our final day, oh yes, so yes, I did do shopping. Here's the talit I bought. I did do shopping. Of course I did. Uh, there's the talit, uh, sorry, a kippah in the top left corner. That was for, that right corner for Rabbi Aaron. Um, the talit that I bought at Nachalat Ben Yamim is right here. Um, I bought Rabbi Albin and my mom and my sisters this uh, hostage necklace that um, is really beautiful and you can only buy in Israel. Uh, and then the bottom was just, you know, my friend Jessica staring at shook candy, which she's obsessed with. <laughs> Anywhere we went. So on our final day, I was super, um, super excited to be able to meet and listen to Mishi Harmon, the creator and host of My Israel Story. Has anyone here listened to My Israel Story? Yeah. Isn't that cool? That's what he looks like. Did you know that? <laughs> His, he, he met us and he said, my wife told me I look like I'm going to the safari. I said, yeah. <laughs> um, so he came um, to speak with us. He told us the entire story of, of how my Israel story was formed. I mean, it's, it's pretty funny, I just have to say. These, he, like, was in the, came to the United States and he basically calls Ira Glass of, of, um, of this American, li what? American life and says, hey, I want to do the Israeli version of your show. And the guy was like, yeah, 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 when you're back in the States, come, come meet us. And, and he, uh, so he and his three Israeli young guy friends get on a plane and go to New York and show up at the office. And they're like, we're here. And they're like, oh, you, do you remember us? And Ira Glass said, you mean the guys who want to steal my show and, you know, produce? Long story short, it is now the most popular podcast in all of Israel. Um, and I, I really encourage you to listen to it. Um, but 
So the minute I got on the plane, I, I had been listening to um, this podcast, My Israel Story, for about a year now. Um, but I was like, got on the plane, I wanted to close my eyes and just, you know, listen to some more episodes of it. So um, I downloaded some episodes, and with my uh, renewed love for Israel on my sleeve, I closed my eyes and I rested my tired body for the first time in two weeks. The first ad was for a new podcast called Unapologetic, a third narrative. I'm like, ugh, ugh. I've already heard so many narratives, and now I have to listen to another one. So I listened. Two Palestinian Israelis tell their story. Israeli citizens, Palestinians. They're peace activists. It's hard to listen to. And as I continued on my journey to unpack my memories of this trip, including listening to that podcast, there's only one takeaway that I can share for sure. A few. No one deserves to be murdered just because of their born identity. Empathy is the most important characteristic that we can teach our next generation. Traveling and talking to the other is the best way to build understanding. And finally, in the end, Israel must continue to be an experiment for holiness and not just war. Shabbat Shalom.